Huh. Watching Kyle's unboxing videos again? Yeah, he always finds the coolest... No way! A robot dog? Gotta ask where he got it. Or use your Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Just draw a circle around the dog on your screen, and it shows you where to buy it right in the app. Oh, I just learned a new trick. And that for once, I beat Kyle to the next big thing. Circle it, find it, with the new Galaxy S24 Ultra, and circle the search with Google. Get yours now at Samsung.com. Internet connection required. Results may vary based on visuals. It seems like we're subsidizing drug addiction. We're subsidizing addiction when we should be subsidizing recovery from addiction. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Phil and you're tuned in to Fill in the Blanks. Thank you for joining me today. In just a few minutes, I'm going to have our guest today join us. I'll tell you right up front, it's Michael Schellenberger. I've actually just finished recording my interview with Michael. I've gone back and listened to it, and I've decided to put a bit of a preamble to this before we actually get to him. Now, Michael, as I'm going to tell you in a minute, was a candidate for governor in the state of California. He's a resident of San Francisco, a city that he loves and cares about a lot. He's the author of a book called San Francisco. I read the book, and I was really fascinated by it. He's written a number of books. I've had him on the show. I asked him to be on the podcast because a lot of what he talks about and points out goes well beyond California. It's very troubling to me in this day and time because what he's talking about and what you're going to hear us talking about has to do with the subtitle of his book, How Progressives Are Really Destroying Some of the Biggest Cities Across the Country. And, you know, I'm not political. I don't get into Democrat, Republican. I'm not interested in getting into that dialogue or narrative, even though we're coming up on elections here. But I am interested in a number of things, and that is what we're doing culturally. I look at it from a psychological standpoint. I think there are certain things that, from a psychological standpoint, we just have to start asking ourselves, and that is, are we behaving responsibly as a society from a psychological standpoint? There are some things you just don't do, individually, collectively, whether it's as a community as an organization, as a country. There are just certain things you just don't do. If you've taken a psychology course in high school or college, one of the first things they taught you, B.F. Skinner, you learned about operative conditioning, you learned about classical conditioning, and what did you learn? You learned that you reward behavior that you want to see repeated, and that you withhold reward or introduce punishment to behavior that you want to see extinguish. Now, I know that at some level you know that, so I'm not trying to be condescending here, but I'm just saying let's think about this in the context of what we're doing in America. If you know me at all, you've heard me talk a lot with drug addicts and alcoholics and all about enabling. Enabling means that you're doing something that makes it easy for a person that's doing drugs or alcohol to continue to do what they're doing. It might be that you're giving them money. It might be that you're giving them a place to stay so they don't have to shape up and get a job. You're providing them food, safety, whatever. You're making it easy for them to continue a lifestyle that's not in their best interest. So what it boils down to is a fundamental principle that you learn in Psychology 101. You do not reward bad behavior. So let's break this down for a minute. We've got cities, particularly on the East and West Coast, that are approaching this drug-addicted culture and Some would say the 
population of people that are experiencing homelessness in a way that is making it easy for them to continue doing what they're doing. Now, let me tell you what I think about drug addiction. If you don't already know, I think drug addiction is a disease. It's a disease that is resistant to treatment. It is subject to relapse. And it is potentially fatal. So I don't think that all of these people that are out there on heroin or crack or meth or whatever can just decide tomorrow, hey, I don't think I want to be a heroin addict anymore, and stop doing it. In fact, if they did, they would probably have bad reactions and potentially die, depending on how long they've been taking it and how much. So I'm not naive about this. It's a very serious disease. That doesn't mean that we should enable those people to continue doing it. There are treatment programs available in all 50 states if people want to get off of heroin, if they want to get off of fentanyl, if it's alcohol or whatever. What we have to be asking ourselves is these programs that we're doing in San Francisco, they're harm reduction programs. Are we doing things that are enabling them, making it easier for them to continue doing it? Now, those that are proponents of this will tell you, hey, not true. Look, what we're doing here is providing them a safe way to use their drugs. We're reducing overdose deaths because we test for fentanyl poisoning. We give them clean needles, so we cut down on disease transmission by needles. We have Narcan available. We don't have overdose deaths. So we're really protecting people. But my problem is, yeah, that's a safer way to do a bad thing. And there's not a strong enough exit corridor here. They have social workers there. They'll encourage people, but they're not strongly incentivized to get off the drugs. And every time they take those drugs, they're putting their life on the line. So I think there needs to be an aggressive program to get them off of it. Michael talks about this. You know, I talked last week to California State Senator Scott Weiner. He brought up some very good points. I just listed some of them. That They make it safer. They don't have overdose deaths. They give them clean needles. They stop disease transmission through sharing of needles, et cetera, et cetera. You think relationship building is going to do it? Again, not a silver bullet, but right. it, it, re- it really matters. If you think about it, the, pe- the people in all of our lives who have struggled with addiction, it makes all the difference in the world when you have people who are persistent about saying, I want to help you, I want to help you. It might take a day or a week or or a year to get into that person's psyche and get them to the point where they're willing to do it. But if if they're all alone and, and no one has that relationship with them, it makes it less likely that they'll go into treatment. But when we do these things, when we fail to prosecute drug behavior, when we fail to require people to get treatment, Are we rewarding bad behavior? Do we need to be more aggressive in getting these people to treatment? It is a disease. And I don't think that you solve the problem of the disease by putting people in jail. I think they need treatment, but I think the treatment needs to be required. You've heard me talk to Donald Whitehead, who I have immense respect for in dealing with those that are experiencing homelessness. And his approach is home first. How do we motivate those people where they say, okay, I've been given a break here. This isn't a hammock. This is a place to lay my head until I can get on my feet. It goes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Once you stabilize them in their housing, um, everything else kind of uh, filters up from there. So people do take pride in that housing, and people do aspire uh, for, for greater levels of success. Now, they don't require drug testing before they'll put somebody in a home. He says it's a right for a person to have a home. Now, 
a lot of those programs don't require you to be drug free to have a home first, but they're very aggressive in following up with these people, encouraging them to get into treatment, and not allowing them to turn these into drug houses. So Donald Whitehead is not naive about this at all, and they're very aggressive, and I think have a better exit quarter. Now, it differs from city to city. So I'm just saying, as you listen to what Michael and I talk about, and if you listen to what Senator Weiner, who I have great respect for, talk about, we have to ask ourselves, are we rewarding bad behavior in our approach to the drug-addicted population and the homeless population? Now, those overlap because within the homeless population, there is a significant percentage that are mentally ill, and there's a significant percentage that are addicted to drugs. So you can't separate them out. But I'm saying we have to start asking ourselves, are we supporting a merit-based system that honors hard work, skill, and knowledge? Or are we rewarding bad behavior? And as you listen to me talk with Michael Schellenberger, he's traveled the world. He's looked at these programs in different countries. He's studied them, researched them, written about them, and we're going to talk about them today. This is important because this is happening in your city, and it's encroaching on the suburbs. It's encroaching on cities throughout the Midwest as well as the coast. I'm not trying to win an argument here. I'm trying to figure out a way to solve a problem, and so I'm talking to people on both sides of the issue and asking the hard questions. Listen to what we talk about and think about, are we rewarding bad behavior or are we embracing a merit-based system? With that in mind, I'd love to hear from you. Go to the message boards. Let me know what you think after you hear this conversation I have with Michael Schellenberger. And there are two parts to it, but that's okay. Hang with me. It's worth listening to. So, Now I'm going to introduce him like none of this had been said because I added it after the fact because I thought it was so important to put a frame around this and a context to it. I'm Katie Maloney, 37, a divorcee, and I'm out here falling in love every day with myself. And I'm Dana Kathan, 33, former needy mess and delusional Leo, but I've never been happier. Never been happier. You know that. Good. (laughs) The foundation of this podcast is for people who want to live their life unapologetically. It's a safe space for anyone who's going through a transition in their life or just dealing with the regular bullshit. It's a religion. We're not saying that we're looking to start a coven, but that might be why we started this podcast. I'm not saying that. Join our cult. I mean, community. I mean, the coven. Religion. Let's just stick with community. Listen to the podcast. Listen to the podcast. (laughs) So enjoy the conversation with Michael Schellenberger. I think you're going to like him a lot. I'm really excited today to have Michael Schellenberger joining me as my guest. If you don't know Michael and his thinking, his philosophy, and his positions, you will by the time we get through talking. And I think you're going to find it stimulating, provocative, and I suspect persuasive in many different ways. We've talked a lot before, Michael and I, because he's been on Dr. Phil, and we were talking about harm reduction, which is a philosophy that believes to avoid deaths from overdoses, that strategies should be implemented to allow drug addicts access to various drugs in a presumably safe way. I'm not so sure that's a really good idea. I don't think Michael does either. Also under the philosophy, it believes that addicts should be allowed resources, housing, etc., without questions asked about one's sobriety. Now, Michael says that his book, San Francisco, Why Progressives Ruin Cities, examines the way harm reduction policies have emphasized personal liberties but ignore personal responsibilities. And he says we need to make people responsible for their behavior and get them into treatment and off the streets. So we're going to dive into that issue and a whole lot more today. Now, he is also the author of some other books that I'm a big fan of, Love Your Monsters, Breakthrough, uh, 
particular favorite of mine is Apocalypse Never, Why Environmental Alarmism Hurts Us All. I'm going to put all of those links on the website, and we'll be repeating them as we go along here. So welcome, Michael. Thanks for having me back, Dr. Phil. So let me begin by talking about San Francisco. Anybody that's been to San Francisco in years past have always thought it was one of the most beautiful cities in the world, one of the most picturesque cities in the world, sitting on the bay there. And there are still parts of San Francisco that are beautiful. I'm sure you would agree. Oh, it's still my favorite city in the world. I I moved out here after college because I am in love with the city and its essence is still there. It's just a very tarnished jewel at this point. Talk about that just in general. What has happened and why is it so tarnished? Because this has to have been philosophical and systemic from top to bottom and side to side for a city to get in this much trouble in this short a period of time. Sure. Well, so San Francisco, it's a very progressive city. It's a city that loves freedom. It's obviously, or maybe not obviously, but I think many people know it's the home to uh, the gay move, the gay and lesbian movement, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender movements. It's been a place of free spirits. It's very libertine, libertarian. It's also um, very compassionate. It's named after St. Francis, of course, who was the the saint of of compassion and taking care of the poor and of nature. And the combination of those two things, those two strengths in excess leads to pathology. And so what's occurred is the coddling of people that are struggling with drug addiction, where they need tough love, they're basically being enabled in their addiction. And so the city is extremely, it's overly generous in the sense of basically providing cash, housing, and many other services to people without any requirement that they address the underlying cause of their homelessness. You know, over 20,000 people come to San Francisco every year as homeless individuals, the vast majority of them struggling with drug addiction and or untreated mental illness. There's ostensibly about 8,000 homeless people in the city at any given time, half of whom are on the streets. And so we've seen a threefold higher overdose rate in San Francisco from drugs, threefold higher than in the United States as a whole or in California. And that's all a consequence of the refusal of San Francisco's leaders to require people to take responsibility for their behaviors, including not defecating in public, not using drugs in public, not camping in public, and many basic laws are, are have stopped being enforced. And so that's what's the fundamental dynamic that's led to the destruction of the city. Look, go back to Psychology 101. One of the things that we know is you just don't reward bad behavior. Go back to Skinner, go back to the most fundamental behaviorist, whether you're in a rat lab, whether you're dealing with animals, whether you're dealing with humans, the behavior you want to see repeated, you reinforce. The behavior you want to see extinguished, you either punish or withhold reinforcement. Seriously, the first week of Psychology 101, that's one of the principles that you learn, and it holds true across species, across ages within the human race, But it seems like this has been forgotten because it appears that there are certain parts within the political spectrum that believe that if you reinforce certain behaviors, that somehow they will miraculously feel a bond of brotherhood and will just stop their self-destructive behaviors. I don't get it. I'm confused. I don't understand how that is supposed to work. But what you're describing, to me, sounds like enabling in its most fundamental form. And enabling, that term gets used so much, I think it loses its meaning. It means making it easier or paving the way for someone to continue to do self-destructive behaviors, either giving them money for drugs, giving them housing, protecting them from prosecution, doing anything that you do that makes it possible for them to continue to do what they're doing. 
That's right. In fact, it's, you, you may be interested to know or you may remember from San Francisco that the 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 turn against having consequences for destructive behaviors, including self-destructive behaviors, the argument against that came from a psychologist, a, a radical left psychologist in the late 60s who wrote a very famous book called Blaming the Victim. And what he argued was that simply enforcing laws in many cases or requiring or having a work requirement for welfare or other responsibilities imposed uh, required of groups that had been historically discriminated against was unjust. And that's where it comes from. And so it starts with we starts with basically, you know, sub, you know, basically incentivizing people not to work with welfare. That was obviously changed decades later. But the argument in defense of that policy was that it was kind of making amends for the injustices that were done to African-Americans for centuries in the United States. And it's very powerful because all of us, I think, most people do feel bad about the history of the United States towards African-Americans, and we feel guilty. And I think that that guilt is very easy to manipulate and make people feel guilty if they then are asking for, say, equal justice under the law. It then goes further and gets what what gets added on to that white guilt is i think the pleasure of caring and it i think we tend to think of caring for others as a selfless act but we know that it, we feel good caring and that's really great we should feel good caring for others but i think we've all seen in our own lives certainly i've seen it depicted on hollywood movies most famously misery with kathy bates uh, adapted from the stephen king novel where people can be pathological in their desire to care, their desire to care so much that they actually end up hurting people either in order to care or to be able to keep caring. And so I think that there's a, some self-indulgence here not in addition to the guilt, which is I think San Franciscans, we feel, you know, it's a very wealthy city. It's a very liberal city. It's powerful people. They had a very good record during the AIDS epidemic in the 80s in particular of welcoming people with HIV AIDS from around the country into San Francisco and treating them. And it was an incredibly positive contribution. And I think that that when that bled into then taking care of addicts, what got missed or what was run over in this desire to care was the fact that enabling addiction worsens the addiction. It actually makes people sicker than they would be otherwise. Well, I don't see that there's any other possible outcome. Clearly, you have to have empathy. Clearly, you have to have compassion. But I've worked a lot with rehabilitation, and I'm not talking about drug rehabilitation. I'm talking about those that have suffered closed head injuries or just physical injuries on the job or car accidents or whatever. And one of the things that we have learned in working with quadriplegics, paraplegics, or those with just severe injuries that have to re-educate their body, is that in order to get better, you absolutely must require the patient to do 100% of what they're capable of doing at every step of the process, or they never get to the next level. So if a paraplegic can get eight or nine feet across the room to flip a light switch themselves, and you could go over and do it for them and just let them sit there, it would be much easier and you'd think, oh, they're so tired, I want to do this for them. But if you do that, you cheat them out of two things. Number one, you cheat them out of going through the muscle movements and creating the muscle memories of doing that. And number two, you cheat them out of the opportunity to observe themselves mastering that and increasing their self-worth and self-esteem because they saw themselves do it. It seems to me that what's happening here when we don't require these drug addicts or these people that are living a compromised life to do everything they possibly can do 
to get back to becoming a contributing member of society each and every day, we're cheating them out of both of those things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of my favorite examples from nature is if you, you know, try to help a baby chick to get out of the egg, then the baby chick will die because the chick doesn't have a chance to build up the neck muscles that are built up while cracking the egg. We see that in the case of homelessness in San Francisco. We used to require that people not camp in tents on the sidewalk and sleep in the shelter. Well, the demand from radical progressives was that people should be allowed to sleep on the sidewalk. We used to say you can't be drunk or intoxicated in public. We then say it's okay. We used to say you can't shoot drugs in public. And they say, well, it's okay. You know, when I my first research foray on with a homeless service provider, the provider was telling me quite proudly that they had done research with the homeless that they were working with. And what the homeless told them is that they wanted the service providers to bring food and clothing to them. They didn't want to have to go to a service center. They didn't want to have to walk a few blocks away. They wanted these things brought to their tents. So you you get a very dystopian perspective. This culminates in COVID, where you basically have the city turning over a very large parking area in front of the 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 San Francisco City Hall and the library with people in tents who would only get out occasionally to shower and but they would also have food brought to them and they would basically only get up to get their drugs and go back to the tents and so you're basically creating atrophy you're creating addicts who are becoming atrophied vegetables because of their chronic methamphetamine and fentanyl use in particular the two drugs have swamped most of the other drugs and are often being used in combination so yeah it's exactly what you described dr phil it's 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 a it's been a gradual process you can sort of trace it as i've done in san francisco over the decades but ultimately you get to a place where basically we've turned what who people that would otherwise be normally functioning adults into babies yeah, it seems to me that we're doing a great disservice when we do that. I was in Washington, D.C. a few months ago, and I was talking to several legislators there, Democrat and Republican alike, House of Representatives and Senators. I spent a couple of days in meetings. One of the questions I asked was, why and how do you decide what subsidies to do. You do subsidies for farmers. You do subsidies for certain industries. And they said, well, we subsidize those things that we want to continue, that we want to flourish. That's what we subsidize. I thought, well, that makes sense. So if you have a drought, for example, in Kansas or Nebraska, so you want to have wheat farmers and corn farmers, so you subsidize them to help them through the rough times. You do whatever because you want to have those farmers, so you subsidize them. So, okay, makes sense to me. We subsidize those things we want to continue. We don't subsidize things we don't. I look at what's happening in what you're describing in San Francisco and what I see in a lot of these progressive cities, and it seems like we're subsidizing drug addiction. 100%. It's definitely we're subsidizing addiction when we should be subsidizing recovery from addiction and recovery from mental illness. You know, one example I think is important to remember is that When we were worried about the deaths and disease from cigarette smoking, we ran campaigns urging people to stop smoking cigarettes. In San Francisco, the city government has run advertising campaigns, and I kid you not, people that don't believe me because it's so shocking can Google this. They ran ads encouraging people to snort or smoke heroin rather than inject it because they thought that that would reduce the likelihood of overdose. That's a kind of campaign that would be trying to reduce some of the diseases associated with cigarette smoking, when in fact, in the case of cigarette smoking, we went right at the root cause, which was addiction. We stigmatized tobacco addiction in the United States, and it was extremely effective. 
Sometimes people went too far and some smokers felt stigmatized personally. But for the most part, we understood that this was a bad habit, that it was better for people to quit. And the society had a public interest in encouraging people to quit. That's not what we're doing with heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, fentanyl, and other hard drugs in places like San Francisco, but also in New York. We're encouraging what we call the safe use. Well, there is no safe use of these drugs. These drugs ruin lives. They are highly intoxicating and highly addictive. So we've created a double standard because we have come to convince ourselves, progressives have come to convince themselves that the people that are addicted to these drugs are actually victims of societal oppression and trauma. And in that sense, we've put, they've put them in a different category of the people who smoke cigarettes. Explain to me what your understanding of that position is. And I'll preface that by saying addiction, in my view, is a serious disease. It is resistant to treatment, it is subject to relapse, and it is potentially fatal. So there is no safe use of these drugs. You are subject to killing yourself each and every time you use the drug, particularly if you're getting the drug on the street, because you don't know what you're getting. You know, if it's got battery acid in it, you don't know if it's laced with fentanyl. And I understand they say in these safe sites... They have a laser they can use to check for fentanyl and all, but that's every time they use it there. That's not every time they use it. That's naive to think that by allowing this habit to continue, this is a medical disease. I'm not judging the individual for having the disease. What I don't understand is how they are in a different category of being oppressed and therefore are held to a lesser standard. What is that argument? Right. So the argument, and it really comes out of the 1960s again, where people with mental illness first were viewed as victims of society. This was a very fashionable idea in the 40s and 50s. There was actually a broad movement to deny that mental illness, serious mental illness, I mean, by, by, by serious mental illness, I'm distinguishing between, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, severe depression, not the ordinary ups and downs that everybody has. And there was an effort to deny that and to say that it was a result you know, first of childhood upbringing, but then increasingly more radical progressive types said it was a result of society injustice. So that was where it first came from. It was then applied to addicts around the time of harm reduction in the 1980s and 1990s. And the fact is that people that are suffering from drug addiction do tend to have higher rates of childhood trauma and abuse. There, there, it's a, there's a comorbidities, in, including dual diagnosis with mental illness. But that doesn't then say that you should not require people to take responsibility or that you should enable those, those disorders from continuing. But it does come from a pretty rigid view that you can categorize people into victims or oppressors, and to victims, everything should be given and nothing required. Let's assume that's all true, just hypothetically. I don't believe that. I don't think you believe that. But let's say, for argument's sake, that we buy off on all of that. Where is the corridor to regaining mental, emotional, social, spiritual balance and becoming a self-determinative contributing member of society? Well, what the advocates of this radical harm reduction approach say when you push them on that question is they say, well, the data show that if you give people needles and you have a positive social interaction with them, then they're more likely on their own to decide to quit doing drugs on their own. But they, they, th th that is actually not the case by the way, of what the data show. The data show that exactly what you've been saying, which is that when you enable, when you coddle, you reduce the incentive for people to quit. 
We know that there's a whole branch. The most effective branch of addiction recovery is something called contingency management, which is providing people with rewards for recovery, for abstinence, whether that's a gift certificate or praise or housing. And so one of the most famous examples in Birmingham, Alabama, homeless crack addicts who were in homeless shelters, if they pass a drug test, they would get access to housing. If they fail the drug test, they go back to the shelter, not to the street, but to shelter. And that 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 incentive provided them with a way out. Whereas what we've seen in San Francisco and in California is a severe increase in street homelessness, street addiction as a consequence of really 20 years of reducing the consequences for destructive behaviors. Yeah, there are certain diagnoses, and I don't need to get specific and go down the diagnostic path, but there are certain diagnoses that have a poorer prognosis than others because from their point of view, what they're doing is working for them. What we used to call the psychopathic personality, for example, which now is more referred to as the antisocial personality or whatever. They might have a poorer prognosis in therapy than certain other diagnostic categories because in their assessment, in their ability to read the room, like, I don't see the problem. Everything seems to be working for me. Then they're less motivated to change, to seek new coping mechanism, new engagement tactics, new coping skills or whatever, because it seems to be working for them. And I fear that in these harm reduction protocols, if someone is perhaps in a housing situation where they're provided housing, they have a safe center where they don't have to worry about dying from overdose because they have somebody standing there with pockets full of Narcane or whatever. They're getting money from the government for essentials. I don't ask myself why they continue. I ask myself why not. A, they don't want to get sick. And they all think, of course, if I start to process off of these drugs, I'm going to have withdrawal. Even with medical supervision, it's not going to be fun. And right now, I'm part of a group, and the number one need in all people is to belong somewhere, to be accepted, and the admission criteria for the drug culture is one-dimensional and very low, and that is that you do drugs. You don't have to be tall, short, fat, skinny, clean. All you have to do is do drugs. That's the admission criteria. You do drugs, you're in. So I belong to a group. I'm accepted. I have a safe place to do drugs. I've got housing. I get government money. I don't ask myself why they do it. I ask myself why not. I don't see the motive to do a U-turn and start swimming upstream and requiring a lot more from myself, which is why you've heard me ask some of the progressives, where is your exit plan? I get that there are some upsides to this. But where is the exit ramp? What is your plan to get these people to sobriety? Where is your push? Where is your contingency where they are incentivized to sobriety? What I hear them say is, well, we have social workers there, and they're prepared to chat them up and be ready when they want to do it. But I don't understand the urgency that I think is required for a disease that can kill you. Well, there is no urgency, and it's not even a priority. Uh, Certainly getting people into recovery is not a goal. And you even had the governor of California say, you know, that he does not want to require sobriety for people in homeless shelters or homeless housing, that he himself likes to let down with a glass of wine. And I think that, which is a very luxury belief, by the way, that's a a belief that, uh, you hold if you're in a state of privilege, but actually causes harm to others. You, know, you got to remember, you know, San Francisco, they, they literally, and this is a quote from one of the, the gentlemen I interviewed on the street. He said, if we're being honest, they pay you to be homeless in San Francisco. They pay you $650 a month in cash uh, benefits. You can get another 100, 150 in food stamps. And then they, or, or you can get free housing with no requirements of sobriety. 
And yeah, basically people just offering you free stuff all day, free food, free clothes, free drug paraphernalia. The cost of the drugs is very low because they don't enforce laws against open air drug dealing, which makes the cost of the drug dealing very low for the dealers. And so, you know, people are able to maintain their habits in San Francisco for somewhere around somewhere between 20 and $60 a day, depending on how much you use. So you're absolutely right. It's not the priority. I think there is a darker motivation here. And I'm not saying it's the primary one, but it's definitely a motivation, which is that the people who are advocating for the status quo are people who want to build a lot more housing and are basically using the large population and growing population of homeless people to make the case for more housing. Now, I happen to support the need for more housing. I think that millennials, as they're making families, that we do need more abundant housing in California. But I don't think it's right to suggest that the people that are living on the street are there, oh, just because they their wages didn't keep up with rents. You know, millions of people leave California every year or over the last over the several decades. Millions of people leave for, for cheaper states to live in. If people lose their jobs and they don't have an underlying drug problem or mental illness, they don't get to go live on the sidewalks. It's way too dangerous and scary. People end up there. And, you know, as you mentioned, there's so many reasons for people not to quit. One of which is that you're usually completely alienated from friends and family, many of whom you've lied, stolen or cheated from. You've probably done some pretty terrible things to support your habit. The vast majority of women that I've interviewed have been sexually assaulted because in part because they're engaged in sex work. The men are engaged in theft. They don't want to have they know that going to a life of sobriety is going to require. I mean, people have a sense of what recovery requires. It requires confronting your demons and your own past behavior. and the possibility of just getting high and escaping all that right now is just a much greater pull, especially when there's no real incentive or real consequence for continuing self-destruction. Well, I have no doubt that a huge percentage of these people have dysfunctional histories, dysfunctional families, dysfunctional adjustments, but Again, that's why you go to treatment, particularly dual diagnosis treatment. You deal with both simultaneously. You deal with the addiction and you deal with the psychological triggers that are likely to restart the addiction when you get back out. And I think these are not these 28-day, one-size-fits-all rehabs. Most of the people that I've dealt with over the last 20 years of doing Dr. Phil oftentimes leave the city where they're practicing addicts and never go back to that city because that's where all their triggers are. That's where all their dealers are. That's where all the relationships are. They're often in treatment for 120 days or 180 days. Then they go to sober living for six or eight months and then a halfway house where they're working full time, but living in a supportive environment. And it may be a year, two years before they're fully rehabilitated, but along the way they're working and contributing and gaining traction, but they're off the street. They're making money. They're paying their way. And that starts almost immediately. So it just seems to me that nothing short of urgently pursuing that is going to change the course of events. And if you look at the homeless population, around a third of the people statistically have an acute problem with alcohol or drugs, and two-thirds of the people have lifetime history. So it's either acute or chronic, and you add to that those with mental illness, you really have a population that needs help and treatment, not enablement. It just drives me crazy when I hear about it. Next week on Fill in the Blanks, Michael Schellenberger and I continue our conversation and dig even deeper into some of these issues that I think are outcome determinative in a lot of people's lives that deserve to be healthy and happy and pursuing the American dream. 
I would immediately put in place a statewide psychiatric and addiction care system that allows social workers to get people into drug rehabilitation or psychiatric care immediately within a few hours. Particularly after people overdose is a great time for them to get into that care. And then I would have a shelter first housing earned policy.